You're listening to AM 1080 KSEO Santa Cruz. It is Tuesday, August 21st, 2018. And when you know it, nothing's going to work. But that's okay because we have uh, joining us one of our favorite guests. Um, the only guest we have booked today, Mark Hastings. How are you doing, Mark? Did you want me to introduce you in a British accent, for, really? Uh, if you would, that'd be great. <laughs> no, that's okay, Dave. Okay, good. Hey, I don't know if I could Listen, do that, man. I am super excited to be back on with you. Thank you for having me again. Sure, sure. Okay. What are we talking about today? Mar no, first of all, Mark, uh, you were here before, right? You are a chiropractor, correct? Chiropractor and author. And author. The name of your book? The Well of Truth, The Secret to Living a Better Life. Okay, now last time we were here, a lot of people had questions for you, right? Are you, are you still going to take questions? Would you still be willing sure, to take sure, questions sure. on this? Okay, so explain to me what the, uh, the point of that book is. The point of the book is to let people know that they have control of their thinking. And once they get control of their thinking and they understand that their thinking is the rudder to their life, then they can steer their life to wherever they want it to go. But for the first thing that people need to understand is that people are not a victim of their thoughts unless they are a victim of their thoughts. What do you mean? Well, a lot of people just think that their thoughts happen randomly, and they also think that their thoughts, even if they're kept secret, don't have any effect in the world of circumstance. But the reality is that every thought that you have, whether it's good or bad, creates its own kind in the world of circumstance. Good, good thoughts create desirable circumstances that you like that'll give you what you want. Mm -hmm. And bad thoughts create undesirable circumstances that are very unpleasant but have a purpose to teach you the difference between right and wrong. But we're all the same. We're all living, thinking beings, and we all are responsible for our very own life, whether it's good or bad. But this, the information, will give people the ability to transform their thinking and thereby transform their circumstances, and their destiny to everything they want. I don't see how that's possible, Mark. The brain is a very complex thing. We all know that, that the brain is a very complex thing. And that book looks incredibly thin. It is incredibly how, how thin. Can that, how can that book possibly uh, give you the key to fine-tune your brain? What, what, what is this that you call it anyways? Is there a, um, a happiness coach? What, what do you call it? How, how, how would you describe what you do? Well... So it took me 20 years. I had about 50,000 discussions with patients and I would constantly ask people, you know, what they thought success was for themselves. And I read all these books on the power of thought and what it is. Mm -hmm. And so eventually my eldest stepson, who I love Nathaniel, but has not been having life go the way that he wants. Mm -hmm. And my wife would talk to me about this every night, every single night, come home from work. This was the, the purpose of our discussion. And I told her, you know, he needs to read this book and this book and this book and this book. And she said, he won't, he won't do it. But I knew the information by heart. And I said, okay, well, and I said, why not? She said, well, he just doesn't have that kind of uh, attention span to read all that stuff. And I said, all right, I'll sit down and I will condense just the information in the book mm -hmm. into 60, 70 pages. And I did. And I've been selling this book now for a year and a half, and I've got testimonial after testimonial after testimonial. And I'll tell you one that just came in last week. I have a wonderful patient. Her name is Rebecca. Mm -hmm. She was a chaplain for her whole life. You know, a chaplain is a very serious career. College degree, long term, you know. And she came in. She loved me as a chiropractor. And she says, oh, wow, you wrote a book. And she goes, I'd love to get a copy of that. And I said, great, I'd love to get your feedback. She says, well, I'm moving to Santa Fe, and I won't be able to tell you I'm leaving today and I mm. said oh okay so a year went by and she came in just last week my wife was there Lori who I love and uh, she walks in and she says Dr. Hastings hey I read your book and it changed my life I said oh really how and she goes I'm not a chaplain anymore I became an artist and I'm showing my art in all of these galleries and that's what I'm doing and I get these testimonies all the time. Well, what is a chaplain? Isn't that kind of somebody who preaches the word of God? I mean, isn't that like a religious person? A chaplain technically is someone that helps somebody across a spiritual divide during a time of crisis. And they don't have a specific... They, it's, it's not according to what they want to tell you, but they just, you know, like if you're going to die, generally, mm -hmm. that's what it usually is, then they'll intercede. And in the span of like maybe a few minutes, they can gain enough trust to guide you to a spiritual place that you need to go to. Like, you need to get in touch with this right now. And they have the ability Isn't to do that. Isn't that bizarre? Isn't that bizarre? If you're oh. dying, that, that yeah. that's on your mind. You know, I, I, 
what, what, that's weird. Well, what, what would be on your mind if you were... I, 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 I don't know. I, I guess maybe it would be something like that. Um, I, evidence seems to point that, yeah, I would have those thoughts. Yeah, right. You and I had that big talk that day. Mm -hmm. Remember when we took that walk in the right, forest? Yeah, right. Yeah, we, we had talked a about a lot talk. of cool things. And, and some of the things that we talked about, we're going to talk about today, and that is a uh, history of our local um, mountains, right? Okay, this is what it is, is I've got a story to tell you. It starts... In January 24th, 1848, and brings us to the present day in Aptos. Okay, it's the history of the railroads and the logging and everything that happened and why and how. And uh, that's a All really, right. it's a really interesting story. I All think right. you're going to love it. That sounds great. That sounds fantastic. That's that's one of the things we're here for. Uh, we also want to let people know about this book. Oh yeah. Yeah, so um, I wanted to let all the KSCO listeners know that we're running a Dave Michaels Flight 1080 special for the next 48 hours. Nice. And if they go to my website, thewelloftruth.com, we have a special promo. And this Absolutely. gets right to it, right? right. This is not a whole bunch right. of, this is my life story and, uh, and my dog and all this kind of stuff. Well, this, this gets right to it. Here's what it is. I think most people know that good thoughts produce good circumstances. So they know that if you're like sure. nice to somebody on the street, they're going to be nice back to you. Sure. But if you, you know, you're thinking about this person and you decide you're going to flip them the bird, that may not work out so well. It might not be the circumstance that you want. But the thing that people don't understand is why can't they have positive thinking all the time? What's interfering with that? And the first six or seven chapters of this little teeny thin book explain what that is. But what if you could get control of your thinking and you could craft your thoughts in a way that it only created the circumstances that you desire, gave you success in your love life, in your friendships, in your career, in your health, in your body. Hey, listen, Dave, when I was young, I had a really terrible childhood growing up with violence in the home, gunfire, all terrible. And I was a really angry young man. And that's how I went to seek all this information out. And it transformed my life. I became a doctor and a commercial pilot, a wild animal trainer for the Navy, all these loving husband, all these things, okay? It worked in my own life. And so I believe the information and I decided to share it with my eldest stepson. And then as the book was being edited, my editor said, look, Mark, you got to share this with the world. You can't just give it to one person. This is important stuff. And so we did. And the name of the book again? The name of the book is The Well of Truth, The Secret to Living a Better Life. And I called it The Well of Truth because there was a paper that I wrote on success after interviewing thousands and thousands of patients. I would ask people, what, what is success to you? And they really never had an answer. Mm -hmm. So eventually it boiled down to success is not what, but where in your friendships, in your relationships, in your career, in your health, in your body. And so I asked people, well, where do you want to have that success? And they're like, yeah, I want to have it in all of it. And I said, well, what are you doing? Most people were pursuing a pile of money. Mm -hmm. And they figure that's just going to fix everything somehow magically. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of very, very wealthy people. And not, their friends won't talk to them. Their family won't talk to them. They've got but terrible But that's nothing to do with their money. That has to do with them, right? I it mean, they're miserable do, people probably. It has to do with their thinking. Yeah. You are what you think. That's it. You are what you think. We all, our reality, Dave, is nothing more than the thought that we're thinking right now. And you have the ability and the power to change your reality by changing one thought. Boom. Done. It's done. It's changed. But people don't know that. They think that they have to live these thoughts that are in their head, and they don't. They don't. People can change their thought pattern, change their narrative, Anytime they want. Well, what, what if you uh, become happy at the expense of others, right? So That uh, is not a rightly conditioned frame of being, and that is not But there, there are people like that, I, right? No, no. There's people that derive sick pleasure. Right. That's not the same as being having joy and a sense of well-being and peace of mind. They don't have that. Trust me, they don't have that. But I'm going to tell you a story. So one of my favorite people in the world, Jerry Burke, great philosopher, asked me one day, he says, what is reality, Mark? And I said, it's what you think it is. And he says, well, that's why I want to interrupt and argue you. And I said, okay, but before you interrupt and argue me, Jerry, let me ask you two questions. And he says, sure, what? I said, do you remember when your first wife divorced you and left you and how that was the worst thing that ever happened to you? And he said, yeah, I do. And then now he's since happily remarried. I said, do you remember when it was the best thing that ever happened to you? And the conversation was over. Mm -hmm. he, so that's what it is. Reality is what you think it is. And you can change the way that you think and what you think anytime you want, but you don't know it.
And you don't understand that the thoughts that you're thinking that are creating the circumstances in your life that you don't want are coming right out of your own thinking. Not somebody else's, yours. Mm -hmm. How do you get control of it? Here's how you do it. You read the well of truth. There's a simple one minute a day exercise. And if you do it, it will change your life. All right, man. How do we get a hold of this book again? They sell it downtown at the bookshop. Well, the easiest way is just to go to thewelloftruth.com. Okay, Mark Hastings is joining us. You're going to be here till about uh, 6 o'clock, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We've got a lot to go over. So we, we do have a lot to go over. Now, you're here to tell us a story, right? Right. That began back in 1848? Yes. Do you want me and, to start and, and, now? And ends now and, and leads all the way up to, to certain conditions. Oh, yeah. It's, it, current it, conditions here. Changed the entire world. Okay, we only have about five minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna sh keep... should we get started now? Should yeah, we just yeah, yeah, tease yeah. It? Okay, okay, all right. So, so okay. what is the story? Uh, okay, so... Uh, what is it? Tell me. January 24th, which is my wife's birthday, but in 1848, gold mm -hmm. was found in Coloma, California, the beginning of the California gold rush. Okay. Okay, so that brought in 300,000 people into California over the next three years to look for gold. And at that time, there was hardly any population in California. California had been run by the missions in Spain and then uh, given to, to given to Mexico. And then they gave the land of the missions to, uh, they were called ranchos, to the, the inhabitants around the area. And Aptos was given to the Castro family. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... 12 days after January 24th, 1848, California became an American territory from Mexico. We had the Mexican-American War, and it terminated 12 days after, after the gold rush started. Wow. So the gold was Mexico's all this time, but... By a, so you tell me, uh, the gold was discovered on this day, January 24th, 1849. 40, 1848. 1848. Then why, why is it the, the 49 gold rush, the 49ers? Why, well, because that was the year that everybody rushed in. And I remember it being discovered from, from uh, being in school, Sutter, Sutter Mill, Sutter Fort. That's right, Fort, Sutter Mill in right? Colima, California. That's oh, is, right. is that where it is? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's where it is. So, so, so let me go on. So what happened was people were immigrating in droves. As a matter of fact, the San Francisco Harbor was full of abandoned ships. They couldn't go in or out anymore. There was all these ships. And eventually they sank, and the wharf is built on those timbers to this day. But there was a huge influx of Chinese, Croatian, and people from Europe. But there were two people that came from Europe that are... Ext I, I got notes for you. I'll send them to you later. You don't okay, need to write yeah. all this down. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you about these things, too. <laughs> okay. So, Frederick Keene and Adolf Claus Spreckles mm -hmm. came from Germany... And Heen came specifically to find gold. But he got here. He ended up in San Francisco, and he became a businessman catering to all the people that were coming for the gold. He didn't actually get out to gold fields right away. And then his business burned down. And he went up into the hills in Sacramento, and he started a gold thing, and then it all washed away. And by This a, is Heen you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, by, by a strange turn of events, he ended up walking to Santa Cruz. Okay. And he got to Santa Cruz, and he had some money, and he purchased... The Soquel Rancho um, land grant from the Castro family, and it, it, it he bought all the land from Nicene Marks all the way to Cabrillo College, and he there was a huge demand for timber and lumber to house all these three hundred thousand people in the bars and the saloons and the hotels and the houses and all that. So mm -hmm. the timber industry was just booming at that time. Spreckles had come here, and he wanted. He was a hotelier, and then he became the sugar beet millionaire. Mm -hmm. And he and Heen decided that they wanted to bring the railroad to Santa Cruz, and they wanted to get taxpayer bonds to pay for it. And so, in in the uh, early 1870s, they they tried very, very, very difficult to get this to happen. And eventually, by 1875, they had accomplished just that. And they had run 20 mi 21 miles of narrow gauge rail from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. And that was the main line. That's called the main line. Okay. And they had done this because to, to benefit both of them, right? F. Exactly. F.A. was uh, going to use it for lumber. Spreckles was going to use it for his sugar beet. Absolutely. And, and sugar Absolutely. Okay. But the problem was the city of Santa Cruz was trying to block Heen and Spreckles from using um, bonds, taxpayer dollars, to pay for it. 
So Heen actually had to borrow money from Spreckles because Spreckles had the money. Okay. But Heen wanted control, and Spreckles didn't want him to have it. But Heen eventually did gain control. And that caused the Santa Cruz Rail Company to falter and to go into bankruptcy. And um, it went up to auction, and Heen ended up buying it outright for $195,000 and sold it wow. to the Southern Pacific Railroad for 225000 at that time. So Spreckles got all pissed off, and he moved to Watsonville and opened up the Watsonville Beet Sugar Company and then eventually moved it off to Salinas. But he, he left Aptos on account of that, and Heen stayed on. And so he talked the Southern Pacific Railroad Company into running a spur line off of the main line up the Aptos Creek, 3.7 miles, and they founded the Loma Prieta Lumber Company and the Loma Prieta Mill, which was the largest lumber company in Santa Cruz County at that time. Okay, so let's stop right there. Where is that in regards to the track that goes right through Aptos, right there by the um, by the Starbucks and the barbecue place and all that, right? There's a railroad track that goes right there by that stop sign. Yeah. Where, where is that? So you know where the road goes into Nicene Marks Park? Yes. That is that is the old lumber mill road. Okay. Okay, and so it went up Aptos Creek, 3.7 miles. and a Up into Nicene Marks? Yes, 3.7 miles, and the town of Loma Prieta, and the Loma Prieta yes, Mill. Yes, okay, yes. I, okay, I remember seeing pictures of that and, and the railroad going right past the mill. I, I remember seeing that now. Yeah. So, they ran a standard gauge rail because the Southern Pacific always ran st standard gauge all the time. Okay. And um, the Loma Prieta Mill started to harvest all this timber and run it down to the mill. And then, Monta Vista Mill opened up above it, way up on top, up by Sand Point. And they ran a five-mile line up there. Mm -hmm. And this went on through the 1880s all the way through to 1922 when, when the whole operation finally ceased. But during that time, there was incredible storms. There was a huge storm in 1899 that washed out the entire Monta Vista mill. And that shut them down till 1910. Do you got to stop and go to yeah, commercial? Yeah, we got to I, I was. I'm getting totally fascinated. I'm totally losing okay, okay, track of time. Okay. okay, so hold it right there, okay? We're talking about the Monta Vista mill. Also up in Nicene Marks, this was higher up the up the uh, up in the park than the Loma Prieta Mill, which a, you know, a lot of us locals know about. But I had never heard of the Monta Vista um, logging mill, so we'll talk about that on the other side. So right now it just got washed away, right? 18, yep. uh, 1899. 1899. Okay, we'll talk about that on the other side. That's where we'll pick it up. We're sitting here with Mark Hastings again. If you want to pick up his book, it's called The Well of Truth: The Secret to Living a Better Life. Half off today and tomorrow for listeners of KSEO, The Wellness of Truth. Dot com. Check the it well out. Of truth. The com. well of truth. The well of truth. I'm looking right at it, too. Uh, 479 at com. We're going to break for news. David Corsi is standing by. Keep it tuned in. You're listening to KSCO, serving Monterey, Brookdale, and San Lucas. Seven nine one zero eight zero. You're listening to Flight 1080 KSCO Santa Cruz. We're bringing you some uh, local history today with the help of Mark Hastings. If you want to check out his book, it is called The Well of Truth, The Secret to Living a Better Life. Check it out at thewelloftruth.com. There's a special going on for the next 48 hours for KSCO listeners. Do they have to type in some kind of promo code or anything like that, Mark? No, they can just uh, click on the banner and it'll give them instructions on how to get whatever kind of book they want. If they want to get an ebook, a Kindle book, a, a hard copy, whatever they want, you know, there's a special instructions how to do that. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so, Mark, when we left off, we were talking about the storm, uh, 1899, Monta Vista. You said there was two logging camps, right? You told me that off the br off, yep, yep. off air. Uh -huh, yep. Two logging mills named Monta Vista. So uh, we left off. One of them had just been washed out. Well, the one there was only one at each time, but in nineteen okay. there was nineteen ninety nine. They rebuilt it. Excuse me, eighteen ninety nine. There was a huge spring storm that completely and utterly washed out the mill at Monta Vista, and it shut down that whole area for about ten years. Mm -hmm. And then they came back in, and the Loma Prieta Lumber Lumber Company again decided to go in and log again. And there was this um, really really steep terrain up Hinkley 
Creek and up China Grade, mm-hmm. and they wanted to go and get that. And it was really, really steep, steep, steep terrain. And the Southern Pacific ended up annexing the railroad, and they put in another spur line and a narrow gauge, and they formed the Molina Lumber Company, and they went in and got that lumber. But anyway, this is up on China Grade, the Molina Lumber Company. Yeah, up, up China Grade and Hinkley Creek. Okay, but up off Hinkley Creek, so after. The flood of 1899 in 1906, there was another uh, mill up there, again called Monta Vista No. 2. Mm-hmm. And they had a huge, huge thunderstorm that caused the log pond to rupture. And it sent logs down into the mill and trashed it. And they were trying to rebuild, but then the 1906 earthquake happened. The water was, the land was really saturated and really wet. And a huge landslide. Yes. Uh, it washed over the mill and buried nine loggers in a hundred feet of rubble and trees what? and formed a lake over their grave. And it took them years to wow. dig them out and they did. They did dig the bodies out? They did They did finally dig the bodies I, out. I, I remember hearing about that and I was wondering how could that much landslide, but that's what it was. It was already saturated. And it was the earthquake. And you throw in the earthquake, the 1906 quake, and that that's yeah, I, yeah. I've heard about that. Yep, yep, that's what happened. And, and where did that happen again? That happened up at Hinkley Creek, which Hinkley is Creek. up at the top of uh, Soquel Creek, and I was at the far north end of Nicene Marks Park, and then on where where they where they were doing the logging there at right, that time. Right. So, the logs all have to come downhill. Mm-hmm. That's how it has to happen. Right. So the fallers would go in in the winter when it was cold, and they would fall the trees and try to fall them on the uphill slopes so they wouldn't break because redwood breaks. So they really highly specialized dudes, and they did this all, all by hand. Have you ever seen an old growth redwood, Dave? No, uh, the big fat one. Big it's fat as tree. big a, as, as big around as the room that we're standing in. That's how big around they are. And so what they do is they climb up the trees and they would make notches and springboard them, which meant they'd build a little scaffolding. And I've seen these scaffoldings and they're very very sketchy. And they take hand saws and saw down these gigantic redwoods that weigh hundreds of thousands of tons. And they'd have to make a bed of timber for them to land on so they wouldn't break. And then they would carve them all up. And in the spring, they would come back and they would light the forest on fire and burn everything up, all of it. Just burn the forest down. And that would get rid of all the slash that was in the way and all the debris and all of the bark that they had taken off the big redwood logs. And then they would drag them downhill with teams of oxen. And then later, they started using steam donkeys to do that. And a steam donkey is like a a locomotive with no wheels on it. Mm -hmm. And they would drag those things in there themselves. In other words, they would take the run out the cable off the drums, tie them around big trees, and then cable them up the hills to where they needed them. And they made things called skid roads. And the Chinese built all the skid roads, by the way. And they they had China Camp, which is where Hoffman's historic site now is. Okay. If you've ever been there, yes, you I, know where I, that I, is. Yeah, I yeah. went there uh, last month. So they would carve these roads, and they would put redwood rounds on the road like, like railroad ties. Mm-hmm. And they would skid the logs down them. And they would have the teams of oxen or the steam donkeys do this job. And they'd have kids with buckets of fat, tallow, and they would slather it on the logs so that the logs could come down easily to the mill. Once they got down near the mill, they would float them in, in the log pond to the mill. And then they had all kinds of different kinds of mills. Initially, the mill started off with just a hole in the ground and two guys and a saw. Mm-hmm. That was the first mill. You know, you're talking about logging ponds. I think when we went hiking, uh, you pointed out that a lot of those ponds that we see in the hills are just that, right? They're logging ponds, not not uh, natural springs or anything that popped up naturally. They were there for logging. Correct. Yeah, all those ponds that you see in the mountains, they were all mill ponds. Because that was the easiest way to get the timber over to the mill. Then they would use a thing called a cant hook to roll them up onto the mill and then eventually mill now, them. Are you talking about the log pond where the guy goes out there and runs on the log? Yes. And has a st- you, th- yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah, Yeah, that's where that sport came from. Wow. Yeah, yeah, where the guys would run on the logs and try and knock each other off of the logs and all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. So uh, that, that was happening up here? Oh, absolutely was happening up here, yeah. So they had actually dammed the Aptos Creek for a long, long time, and um, they had a huge, huge log pond. But anyway, you know, Dave, sometime I'll take you in Nicene, and I'll show you where the spring of 99, where that huge disaster was. It left mm-hmm. a log jam that's still there. I would love to see that. Oh, yeah, I'll show it to you sometime. And, and along what trail is that? Um, we'll have to go in and I'll have to go refigure it out. So what happened yeah. was I used to be a cyclist and cycle in Nicene Marks. Mm. This is how this all got started. There was this old fable that Heens 
fabled narrow gauge Betsy Jane fell off the rails yes. up in Hinkley Creek. Right. And got, that's not true. So what wait, wait, don't tell me it's not. I, that's such a local legend. You're telling me that, that it's not true. I, I believe it's not true. So oh. I, I, I was riding and I seen marks all the time and I had heard this story of like people coming across it. And if any callers know that they're, if it is there and they can show me where it is, I'll, I'll give them a free treatment and a free book. <laughs> I would like to know where it is, too. I mean, but, holy cow. But so the thing was is I went and hunted and hunted and hunted for it for years and couldn't find it. So eventually I went to John Hibble at the Aptos Museum, and he's a local historian. And I said, John, look, I've got this problem. And he said, here are all these books on the railroads, and you can find there. But what happened was the Loma Prieta Lumber Company had two Shea 10-and-a-half-ton locomotives that were cut up for scrap at the Aptos station. That's okay. what happened. Okay. And then Heen's little locomotive went up to Felton after he was done using it up Valencia Creek at mm -hmm. the Heen Mill, where he, because he milled all of that timber and harvested all that timber for himself. He had huge interests in both the Loma Prieta Lumber Company and in the Molina Lumber lumber company he had his hand in all of it so he had you know he had his hand in everything he was the richest guy in northern california for years and definitely the richest guy in santa cruz county i've seen um a manifest of all of his business interests and you can't read through it it's, it's too many he's like 2500 business interests the wow. guy was on fire wow man <laughs> so um let's see where do we go from here um so what happened with the train um, Heen had taken his up to uh, Valencia Road, right? Up Valencia Road to, to... His mill. His mill. What happened with the other trains that were cut up? Is, is that what we hear about that's out there in Nising Marks? Is there anything out there like that? I have seen some old steam donkey remains, which I think people may think that they're looking at the boi boiler to a locomotive, and it's not. Really? Um, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, up around Bridge Creek and... Uh, yeah, so the spur line was put in, the first original spur line from... The Loma Prieta Lumber Company, which was actually a subsidiary of the Southern Pacific, it was 3.7 miles up to Bridge Creek. That's where the main line ran, and that's where the original first mill was, the Loma the Prieta Loma. Mill, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, so the logging went on from 1881 to the fall of 1921, and by that time they had cleared all that lumber out. And here's an interesting thing. All of the lumber in Nicene Marks, every bit of it, went with lumber from Little Creek and Kings Creek um, up to San Francisco. What had happened in the earthquake, San Francisco burned to the ground, and they had a huge demand for lumber, and that's where our redwood, our old-growth redwoods went to rebuild San Francisco. That's where it went. Yeah, uh, um, and, yeah, a lot of people um, might not know that, but a lot of local historians do, that a lot of uh, the, the redwood that was harvested here, went up to San Francisco, went up to the Bay Area to rebuild, yeah, after yeah, specifically. after the uh, earthquake slash fire. The fire is what really did them in, right? That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, that, that, um, the 1906 earthquake and the storms that led up to it, you know, had huge devastating effect on our, our community. Mm-hmm. So uh, now it's 1920. The, the logging industry is on the way out here in, in uh, yeah. Santa Cruz. What happened was after the Molino Lumber Company fi finished uh, harvesting up off Hinkley and China Grade, uh, 1917, the Loma Prieta Lumber Company came back and, and they said, okay, we want to restart the Loma Prieta mill. And they came down to Bridge Creek and Big Tree, uh, Porter Gulch, and they logged that last area. And they were done in the fall of 1921. And that was it. That was the end of the lumber, and it closed. And so they brought out all of the equipment and the tracks and the two Shea locomotives, the two 10.5-ton Shays. They tried to sell them, and a company in Oakhurst made a bid on one of them for $8,000, but it was never delivered. And they cut them up for scrap at the Aptos station. That's what happened to those two locomotives. The Betsy Jane went up to Felton to do another uh, logging project that Heen had in mind. And there was a gas locomotive that used to run up and down the um, Aptos Creek, and it would ferry timber from the Molino. And the Molino was a junction where the tracks split. And it's on that trail that goes up to Hoffman's historic site. That was where that junction was. And one, the, the one tr track was a narrow-gauge rail that ran a narrow-gauge up to 
Hinkley's and China Grade. And then the other track went to the Loma Prieta Mill. And so that was a main junction point. And you can see that in old photos and things. Wow. So are you telling me there was also a trail that went up to Hoffman's? Or a, 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 a railroad, a rail that went up to Hoffman's? Yes, there was. Uh-huh. And that's where China Camp was. And all the lumber that came down there came down a cable line. And then it got ferried with this gas-powered engine mm -hmm. up the opposite side of the creek. Was that the steam donkey? The, the gas-powered engine? Is that a steam donkey? No, no, the steam donkeys were... Was that really uh, run on, on steam? Yes, absolutely. Wow. So, so the forest had tons and tons and tons and tons of waste wood. They couldn't burn it all. They ran these burners 24 hours a day. But all of that powered the mill itself and powered the steam donkeys. Those were run on, on wood. We powered those with wood, not coal or gas. So up in Loma Pri, or up in uh, Nizine Marks, if you look real carefully, I believe as you're walking or, or uh, split and take the trail up towards Hoffman's historical site, you can see a flat road that looks like it probably held, and now that you mention it, a rail. Yeah, well, what's, what's really crazy is that um, they had to build trestles all throughout the park to to go across the creek so that because the trains can't you know go up those steep grade they have to cross and they had those built sometimes uh, in oakland and then prefabbed and then sent down here and then installed i mean it was really complicated how they did all that okay so so um as you climb or you're hiking through nizing marks that's one thing you'll see is that uh, flat rail or that flat trail that could have held a rail up towards hoffman's another thing you'll see is um trestles like you said that appear to be too small for a train um ending you could tell it used to cross this this massive span what what, what was on those was were those looked smaller like they were for hauling logs maybe hauling no those smaller things those that was for the train those were for the trains yeah wow yeah the trains were Boy, that must have been scary it's really crazy how they ran all this different track but they ran standard gauge mainly then they ran um and they ran standard gauge on narrow gauge rails for the Loma Prieta Lumber Company. They, How do you do that? I think, well, I, I've read that um, Heen had wheels made at a foundry in Santa Cruz. So I think he retrofitted the wheels on those Shea locomotives that they, and because he wow. wanted to save money. Right. That was the thing. That's why he always ran narrow gauge. And in, in the Valencia, the Bessie Jane was a narrow gauge. So they, so they ran standard gauge, narrow gauge, standard gauge on narrow gauge rails. It was it was a crazy mix of, of stuff that they did up there. Yeah, that's bizarre. And then another thing you will see is event. Uh, occasionally, you will see railroad ties buried in the in the trail as you go through some of those trails. More than one. Well, if you I, go, I remember seeing those. If you go up to Five Finger Falls, you're going to see them sticking out of the ground at grotesque angles that look like spaghetti. That was the earthquake that did that. That's that, that's that's what happened there. Is you know, those canyons collapsed. You can read historical accounts of the canyons and aptops collapsing during the uh, aftermath of that earthquake when that ground was saturated from that huge thunderstorm that came in ahead of it. You're talking the 1906 quake, not the 1989 quake. 1906 quake. 1906. Yes. Wow, dude, that is that is fascinating. Um, <clears throat> 471980, if you have any questions for our guest, we are speaking with Mark Hastings. Uh, he'll be here in, uh, for at least a little over another hour. Mark, tell us the name of your book. Oh, the well, the well of truth, the secret to living a better life. I'd love to talk to callers about that because this book is changing lives. I get testimonials every week of people telling me that, you know, their life was terrible. They read the book. They had an awakening. They didn't realize that their thought is the rudder to their life and that you can grab your rudder and steer your life whichever way you want just by gaining control of your own thoughts. Super easy to do. It takes an hour to read and a minute a day. I'm telling you. Everybody should read this book. Okay, Mark. So um, how far away are we from current day, from modern day and what we're talking about now? So uh, um, it is 1920, right, or around that time. It was the fall of 1921 when the lumber operation stopped. And But the thing was, without the gold rush um, and without all these people coming to, to California, specifically to Aptos and Heen coming here, we would have never developed. This would still be, nothing would be going on. Um, Heen brought electricity and the waterworks to Aptos. He brought the infrastructure to Aptos. And if there hadn't have been the gold rush and the need for lumber, none of that would have happened. Um, there's a book that I recommend for you, Dave. It's called Days of Gold. Okay. It's a fantastic... Is it about uh, here in Santa Cruz County? No, this book is about 
the whole history of the gold rush and what happened. But there are accounts from survivors that had tried to cross the plains, mm -hmm. the Great Plains. And there were people that said that when they were in the middle of the plains, they could turn around 360 degrees and look in every direction for as far as the eye could see and see wagon trains that everyone had died in, that they didn't make it. It was just wow. wreckage out there like you couldn't believe. Hundreds wow. and hundreds and thousands of wagon trains of people that were trying to make it to California to do the gold rush, to get gold, to get rich. And, I mean, everybody came. But had that not happened, uh, Aptos wouldn't even be here. So that's a fascinating uh, piece of history. And... Um, Okay, Mark, we got a couple of phone calls. Yeah, let's in. go ahead. Let's take take yeah, I'm ready. Go ahead. All right, let's head out to Santa Cruz and pick up Sandra. You're in the air, Sandra. Thank you for your call. Hi. Do you know if there's any um, information on who worked in those camps? I know my grandfather did. I was just wondering if they, and he was there during the 1906 quake. He was mad because his axe fell on his head. Because when they slept in those barns that they had for him, they put their... Uh, axes up on hangers above their head on the bed and anyway well when uh, betsy i've never what? i've never come across any specific names other than uh the the old historian stodley and if you go on you can read his whole account but he worked with the loma prieta lumber company for 40 years and he talked a lot um, about the life and times of the the loggers and the mill workers and the fellers and the bull masters and all that stuff but no those kind yeah, of things yeah, I was just hoping there was some, you know, little booklet somewhere of the employees. Try, try the, anyway. try the uh, Santa Cruz Public Library. They have an incredible oh. uh, history and account of, uh, of, other, of that type of stuff. Okay. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Bye. You're welcome. Have thank a nice you for your call, Sandra. 479-1080. We appreciate the call. Pete in Santa Cruz is up next. You're in the air, Pete. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, I was wondering if your guest, I was, you know, my earliest childhood memories, there was big stacks of redwoods in Scotts Valley as far as the eye could see. And it was Scarborough Lumber. And I think he had a mill open until the 80s. Okay. And do you know, like, the history of, like, where that wood came from, how they milled all that? Do you know the history of the Scarborough, like, that whole... Pete, I don't know that because I was really looking for the Betsy Jane engine that was fabled to have been lost. But what I can tell you from all of my reading and research is that there were hundreds of mills in the Santa Cruz area. There were mills everywhere, in mill ponds everywhere, and all kinds of private operations and commercial operations. Um, it was really, really complicated. But, you know, during the right after the boom of the gold rush, there was a huge demand for lumber, and everybody was in it. You know, everybody was trying to make lumber. Yeah, I just I just remember Scott Valley back in the yeah. day. It was all stacked up with redwoods everywhere. And I remember they that ended too. Up building the Seagate buildings, they milled it, and like you could see the actual finished products. Yeah, right. right there. I mean, they milled it and sold it right there and developed Scott Valley, but then they kind of disappeared somehow. I don't know if it you know if it just outsourced or. Yeah, I pretty much only just know the history of the uh, Aptos area. Does that, that sound about right, though, Mark? Thank you for your call, yeah, uh, Pete. Yeah, yeah. Um, logging going on until the 80s, 70s, 80s? Well, the logging still goes on. We still log. I watch logging trucks come up and down Browns Valley Road every single day. My wife and I watch them haul the trees That's away right, every they day. They do, huh? Where, where, yeah. So where do those, uh, for people who don't know, Browns Valley is out near Coralitas, where are they logging up there and, and coming down? Where, where are they cutting the, the logs from? I don't know where those logs are coming from, but I watch them go every single day. Yeah. Every yeah, morning, and, and, they, they and, go down the hill. Now that you mention that, every time I see them, I wonder, where and are those logs coming from? The burn mill iron, they, they log all the time. We, we log every two years up there. Really? Yeah, they log every two to three years. Uh -huh, and they're going to wow. log next year. Wow, all right. There you go, 4791080. We're here with Mark Hastings. Again, if you want to check out his book, check out thewelloftruth.com. The book is called The Well of Truth, The Secret to Living a Better Life. If someone should ask, tell them. You heard it on AM 1080, KSCO. All right.
1080 You're listening to Flight 1080 KSCO Santa Cruz. We are here with Mark Hastings. Hey, Mark, check this out. I don't know if you can see these pictures. Somebody sent me these. Oh, yeah, uh, those are so cool. Look, look at that. that. Look at that train hanging out. Off yeah, of that cliff. That, that doesn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> that does not look good. I don't want to be in that train. Do, do any of those things look like um, stuff that you would see here in Santa Cruz? Now, you oh, were telling me that, that you, can, it, yeah. you can find things still out there in the creek beds. Where where do you find um, the remnants of our logging history here in Santa if you Cruz? Want to see I love it because um, even though to you or to, to the average person, it might just look like rusted old junk. And that is not rusted old junk. I mean, it might be that now. But when I see it, that's not what I see. Okay, well, if you go up uh, Bridge Creek and Nicene Marks, it's at the very end of the park. It's the last parking lot, which is only open, Okay. you know, from the summer months. Mm-hmm. And then you follow, you know, up the fire road, and then there's a cutoff that goes to the left, which, which goes up to Hoffman's yes. historic site. And then it either splits off to Westridge or goes down to Bridge Creek. You can cross the Aptos Creek there. And there's a bunch of old logging remains back in there. That's an eight-mile loop. It's a four-hour hike, but it's one of the most beautiful hikes in the entire um, Aptos area. And uh, where is this again? Which which creek? Okay, it, uh, uh, Aptos Bridge Road, you said? You go to the last parking lot, the last drivable parking lot mm-hmm. in Nicey Marks, which is only open in the summer months. They, right. they close it in April. Right. And you follow the main fire road past the gate. Okay. There's a branch line that goes off to the left, and that goes up to Hoffman's historic site. From there, you can either go left and go up to Westridge or stay straight and drop down into Bridge Creek. Once there, you can cross the Aptos Creek at Bridge Creek. Okay. And then it it loops back around. It's an eight-mile loop. It takes four hours to hike. It's beautiful. There's not much elevation gain or loss, so it's a pretty easy hike in that. And there's a lot of old railroad remains. There's old railroad trestle remains, old boiler remains, old tracks, lots of old cable from the steam donkeys. And if you look around, you can see a lot of history there. Uh, Aptos Creek, is that the bridge that, that, is that the one that's covered by the bridge that has that little Buddha um, statue underneath it? Have you seen that? No, I haven't seen wow. that. Uh, there, there's a bridge that has a little Buddha statue underneath there, and people go there and they worship, they pray, or they do whatever. I don't know. They burn candles and um, they have a bunch of prayers. It's it's a spiritual place out there in the middle of the woods. It's really oh, I cool. know. You're, no, that's at Porter. That's at Porter at Porter House. That's at the Porter House, and that that is part of the Aptos Creek. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, Aptos Creek. So you know the fire road in Nicene Marks. Mm-hmm. That was the original Loma Prieta standard gauge spur line that came off the main line from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. And they okay. turned it into a fire road? Yeah. After they pulled out the tracks, it, it remained as a fire road. Yeah. Uh-huh. Four seven nine one zero eight zero. If you have any stories of Nizing Marks, could they share stories with us? Yeah, or- yeah. If anybody knows anything about the lost uh, engine, the Betsy Jane engine, if anybody in the listening audience has seen it, I and, want to And that's I what it's called, you. the Betsy Jane Right? Betsy Jane was the name of that locomotive. You can type in Betsy Jane in Google. Dave, you can type in Betsy Jane locomotive, and you'll see pictures of the Betsy Jane, and there's a rich bunch of history there for you. You can read almost everything I've told you tonight there just by typing in that. Anything else? You know, any other interesting tidbits you know about the Santa Cruz Mountains, about Nizine Marks, um, uh, Valencia Creek, Trout Gulch? Well, Valencia Creek was owned specifically by Heen. He didn't have any other investors in that because when they did Nicene Marks and a lot of a lot of the other mills that he was involved in, he always had other investors and a lot of those people were part, parts of the railroads, specifically the Southern Pacific Railroad, specifically he worked with them. And, um, you know, they were all, everybody was about taking all the timber out of these hills. And uh, what about gold? Was there ever any, ever any gold discovered in these hills other than up there by Bald Mountain? Nothing significant. Uh, nothing significant. Nothing right? Nothing like in Sacramento and uh, Nevada City. And you heard that there was a big piece of quartz discovered out there near uh, Bald Mountain, right? And, the, and this big chunk of quartz was a big rock of gold. No, I never and, heard and that. And so that's why they stripped that mountain down, man. And it is still bald to this day. That's why they call it Bald Mountain. It got bald because they stripped it down looking for gold. Yeah. No more was found, but just that one big chunk was found there. Yeah, yeah. Well, gold drove people crazy in California. I mean, there was so many... Um, murders and schemes and so, so much just really devastating activity over over gold it uh it changed the world the, the the gold rush changed california but it also changed the entire world because the the money that came from that really put uh the west coast of california on the map and gave the united states a lot of its wealth you know so it's it was a huge turning point in history and like i said the funny thing about it is 
12 days after it was found, the United States got California from Mexico. How many days? 12. That is incredible. So you're telling me gold was discovered 12 days later, it's owned by America. Yes, that's what Damn, I'm telling you. boy, yeah. that is rough. Ca- that Cali- is hardcore. California was originally owned by Spain, and they brought the missions and Christianity in and tried to convert the whole alone Indians and the local inhabitants. And then it was um, Mexican gained their independence in 1821, mm-hmm. and then they just decided to just give the land away in ranchos to the local inhabitants, particularly people that are involved in business. And... Um, in 1820 or in 1848 on January 24th they dis- discovered gold at Fort Sumner Coloma and 12 days later on February 3rd 1848 the end of the American Mexican War it, it it ended and and we got California we got all the gold and so that's always been a real controversial thing because a lot of people think you know that there was a conspiracy there and you know, although the Mexican-American War lasted for two years, um, it still is strange that, you know, that it all ends with just a 12-day split where America gets to keep all the gold and Mexico doesn't get to have it. Yikes. Four seven nineteen. You know, Mark, I was, I was really into uh, panning for gold uh, uh, last year, year before, and so I did some uh, oh, cool. research on minerals, right? Where, where minerals, you know, because you want to look for quartz and along with other things, there are clues that there might be gold there. Uh, the two most likely places that I found that still contain gold in Santa Cruz County are... Majors Creek and Gold Gulch. Well, listen, I found appropriately named. I, I found guess. gold. I found gold in what? the yeah yeah. I found little teeny slivers and flecks in the Aptos Creek, and also up of um, up in Scotts Valley. Yeah, so found some little ones. There's a lot of fool's gold, and when you look at that, it's hard and it's crunchy. But if you find real gold and you press your thing- fingernail into it, it's malleable and it'll bend, and that's how you can tell the difference. So when you see gold down in the creeks, it'll always be on a turn. It'll be on the downward side of a turn. Right. And if you look there, you can see the gold sometimes little shining in the water. You go down, you pick it up, and if, if you can bend it with your thumbnail, then you have found gold. But I never found any gold that was worth, you know, but it's still fun, right? But yeah, I mean, it was still that fun. That is fun. I mean, dude, we live in the coolest part of the country ever. This yeah. is awesome. We live in an awesome part of the world. We are so lucky, man. We're absolutely lucky. Oh, we're blessed. Man, I cannot believe it, dude. I cannot believe it. We should get to the phone calls. Otherwise, they're going to Yeah, let's hang. do it. Let's go. Um, let's head out to Watsonville. John, thank you for the call. You're in the air. Hey, you guys. Um, not sure, but uh, there's a narrow gauge engine in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. It's from the Aptos, Santa Cruz area. That's called the Jupiter, and that was uh, the main train. It was ran by an engineer named Daisy, and that was uh, ran on the Santa Cruz line. Yeah, that's called the Jupiter. Yep. Yeah. yeah, my dad was a fireman uh, out of the Watsonville, the Lone Star Quarry up there. They used to run that all the way down before they see how far they can go without running the brakes on the train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called the Jupiter. You can look that up online too. It's a it's a real pretty uh, steam driven locomotive. Thank you for the call, John four seven nine one zero eight zero, DM at KSO dot com. Okay, so two questions I've been getting. Uh, one, how do they find the podcast of the show so they can listen to it again? Go to zbsradio.com dot com or kso dot com. You can find it there. I suggest ZBS Radio. And two, how do we get a hold of your book? <laughs> Dave, um, could I talk a little bit about the book for the new listeners that that are just showing up? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, about four years ago, uh, my eldest stepson, Nathaniel, who I love very much, was going through a hard time in his life. Things weren't going the way that he wanted them to go. My wife was thinking about it all the time, my lovely wife, Lori. And um, I was telling her, he needs to read all of these books, James Allen's As a Man Thinketh and Joe Carbo's book, The Lazy Man's Way to Riches and Eckhart Tolle's book. And she said, he's not going to read all that. And I said, why not? And she says, you know, he just doesn't, he doesn't have that attention span. He'd have to have something much smaller. And I knew this stuff by heart because it had transformed and changed my life. I had grown up in a really broken home, really terrible, angry young man, and I ran across these books and I read them and I applied these principles and changed my life. I became a doctor and a commercial pilot and loving husband, all these things. So I told her, I, I made an assertion to my wife. I said, you know what? I will write the information in all of those books in a condensed format in 50 to 70 pages. And I did it. It took me about two weeks to write the book initially and about three years to get it edited. But the information in this book is transformative. Once people understand this information, it can transform their lives and they can have 
everything they want. They can have success in their relationships, their love life, their career, their health, their body, everything. It's all accessible to them. But they need to understand that your thoughts create your circumstances. Your good thoughts create the desirable circumstances in your life that you that you like, that give you peace of mind and a sense of well-being and joy. But your bad thoughts, they produce undesirable circumstances that are very uncomfortable, that you don't like, that have a higher purpose to teach the difference between right and wrong. If you read this book, you can get, gain this information in an hour, and there's a one-minute exercise to do every day that will help you gain control of your thinking, which is the rudder to your life. Everybody has the same opportunities in life with their circumstances. All they have to do is think the right way. We all create our own life, not somebody else. We all can get control of our thinking. We can all have the life that we want. The name of the book is The Well of Truth, The Secret to Living a Better Life. It is available at Bookshop Santa Cruz, on Amazon, Kindle, iBook. But the easiest way to get it and to get it at half price is to visit my website, The Well of Truth. Dot com. Sounds good, Mark. And, and again, if you don't have a computer, you can stop by uh, Bookshop Santa Cruz or stop by your office. And yeah, one up there, right? If they stop by my office, I'll be happy to sign them a copy, shake their hand, look them in the eye. Uh, Mark Hastings is going to be with us for only a half hour more, so we better get to it. I'm looking at a tree here, a redwood tree, and it's got like 20 people at least holding hands to, to, to surround this thing. At least 20 people, maybe That's 25. Right. That's right. That is it, amazing. Well, th remember, Dave, they cut those down by hand with hand saws. And that's that's just an unbelievable feat. Those those men were, were <laughs> extremely studly real men, you know, to think that they did that. But how they did it is they climbed climbed up the redwood past the very thick uh, bottom, which was not useful to them. That mm. didn't make good lumber. Mm. They climbed the tree high enough to where it ran straight, and then they cut it down at that point. But they had to do that like 12, 15 feet off the ground on these little springboards that they cut into the wood. And then two men with saws literally hand cut those giant redwoods, which weighs hundreds of thousands of tons down. You wouldn't want that to fall on you, Dave. 4719, I've seen these pictures too, the scrawny looking uh, loggers, but boy, you know they were probably just tough as of, nails. Tough and wiry, yeah, <laughs> tough as nails. Let's head out to the phone lines, Mark. Um, Derek calling from Hollister, you're in the air. Hi, how are you? Good, Derek. Excellent, excellent radio today. Thank you so much. Sure. I just wanted to ask you if uh, if you know anything about the willows up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Have you heard of it? No, I don't. I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry, Derek. I, I I'm not a complete historian. I'm a historian as far as it pertains to the logging of Aptos. That's that's really what I know. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. If you uh, just information for you, at uh, back in the day, it was a resort. And uh, I, I don't know a whole bunch about it, but... Uh, oh, I know about all the resorts in Aptos, yeah, with that Heen and Spreckles both made. Yeah, I know all, all that history, too. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. The Willows, you hey. said, though, huh, Derek? Yeah, the, the Willows. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, it's off of Stetson, Stetson Road up there. Stetson Road, okay. I will work on that. That is fun. Fun stuff, Derek. Thank you for the call. I love this stuff, Mark. I love it. I hope other people love it as much as I do because I just get excited. Well, let's do it. Let's okay, hit more let's, calls. Let's, more let's calls. Get more calls. Uh, Steve calling from SoCal. You're in the air. Yes, hi, sir. Uh, um, I met a, a young man uh, about three or four years ago. I think his name was John. Uh, he said his father was... Um, his grandfather or great-grandfather built the Aptos Motel uh, and the railroads. Was that, was that him? Well, there were many hotels, and Spreckles was, uh, Claus Spreckles was the main person that, that built them, but the, there, there's only one remaining, and that's the Bayview Hotel, which is a crazy hotel that's haunted. Right. And so is it haunted? <laughs> it is haunted, and there's a bunch of, there's a mass burial grave Right behind it in the empty lot. Get out of here. Are no, you I'm telling you, yes, I'm telling you the truth. There what? is. I've been back here. I've been back here. They they died from the measles and they buried a bunch of people back there. And <laughs> uh, I've heard so many crazy accounts. We were friends with the owners of the Bayview for years. Um, I still oh. know Christina, but Giovanni has now since passed. He died last year. They didn't uh, bury him out there too, did they? No, but but this they told us story after story after story, and then so I started listening to the patrons of that place, and like everybody has seen ghosts yeah, in there. Uh, are you serious? Everybody, a, a, a mass burial grave out there, a mass burial site? right right behind right behind the Bayview. Yeah, uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah, it's weird back there. Yeah, damn, the yeah. backyard. 
Yeah, thank, I've yeah. been back there. Jeez, thank you for the call, Steve. 479-1080-DM at KSEO.com. Um, yeah, Mark. Is there another caller? Yo, we got, we got plenty of let's calls. Try, we got let's, plenty take, of calls. let's try to get to one. Um, one more, though. Uh, you know, out there, geez, it's not Jensen Road. My, my friend used to live at a, at a house that's haunted out there in Moss Landing. You can see it right off the freeway, and it is the creepiest thing, man. A haunted house is creepy. Yeah. It's just bizarre. Yeah. Um, wow, a mass burial site out there. You can, you, if, you, if you type in the Bayview Hotel, the history of the Bayview Hotel, you can read all about that. Let's see who's up next, Mark. Uh, Nancy, thank you for your call. You're in the air. Hi, thank you. Real quick, um... Mark is absolutely a million percent right about how your thoughts direct your life. Hi, Nancy. You got it dead on. Yes, hi. I'm so thrilled that you are telling the world on radio about it. And people have to be ready at the right time in their life to understand it all. That's true. That's true. But uh, I came to it rather late. But I'm there now. And I'm telling you, I won't get into detail, but... It's like a thousand turnaround. Well, you that's know, fantastic. It's unbelievable. It's the best thing. It's just, it's the number one thing in my life. Well, I would and love to get your feedback on my book. I'd love for you to read it and see what I'm you think. I'm going to get it. Oh, and fantastic. Also, real, real quick, I just want to mention, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Emmett Fox. Yes, I have. He's, he's the guy who writes all kinds of really great books, probably like yours. And he has one called The Mental Diet. And that's when every time you are you go negative, which we all do by accident, you know, and we just do it. But I don't do it anymore at all because I, I've i trained myself. Because you don't want to have and the bad circumstances that it brings. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I used to, well, I won't go into detail, but I was the other way. You know, I was a conspiracy, you know, and all that stuff. So um, I love life and everything's great. And I love you for doing this. Thank you, and Nancy. I I'm appreciate just, that. Um, testimonial to say yes you're absolutely right thank you nancy thank you for the call thank you for the call nancy four seven nine one zero eight zero we got to get out of here for uh, local news zero eight zero dm at kseo.com we are here with mark hastings mark is author of the book the well of truth i got it, mark, it written down here mark uh the secret to living a better life and again 48 hours and you can take advantage of that special that mark has for kseo listeners almost 50 percent off right mark correct okay um let's see what are we going to talk about next we uh, david brought up some some good points and uh i i, I wanted to get back with this um, topic with you too, but I wasn't sure that it was worth going back to. But now Dave brought this up, and that lets me know that somebody else was thinking the same thing. Twelve days after gold was discovered, California was won by the United States, correct? Correct. And the Mexican American. How war. in the heck did it happen that fast? Because at that time there was no telephones, there was no. Uh, well, no, that presupposes that the information was known. Now that's, you know, I mean that's not a, a fact, but it, it looks awfully. Suspicious. I mean, it looks like a conspiracy to me. Well, we know what it looks like. And, and realistically, to, to get any kind of forces moved and to get the word from here to the East Coast and then to get some kind of forces again from the East Coast to here in 12 days seems pretty unbelievable. No, I, I don't know anything about... I, I, I think you're imagining something that possibly didn't happen because this happened... Uh, you know, our campaign to take over the territories from Mexico was not just California, but it also involved Texas mm -hmm. and some other territories as well. And the Mexican-American War had been going on for almost two years, mm. but it ended February 3rd, 1848, okay. Okay. 12 days after they discovered gold. The war had already been going on, though, at the yeah, time. Of yeah, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, you know, it's, it, it would seem like that the people that discovered the gold at Fort Sumner were like, Look, this thing has to end with Mexico like pronto, like right now. We've got to get it. So it was officially announced that, hey, we found gold. Twelve days later, the war's over? Right. That's, that's what happened. 
It was okay. discovered January 24th, my wife's birthday, mm -hmm. 1848. February 3rd, 1848, 12 days later, we won the Mexican-American well, War. Well, Mexico didn't really put up much of a fight, right? Because they didn't really have many forces up this far north in California anyways, correct? I haven't, they were more worried about Southern California. Yeah, I haven't really read through that part of the history that much. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was the largest change in the world at that time. All that gold made America rich, mm -hmm. and it brought 300,000 people in the span of three years to California and ultimately just changed everything everything changed yeah because if i remember correctly um uh fremont right which was named after the, the explorer fremont came back over here uh to lead several operations i believe they just rolled right over whatever forces were here because there's basically nothing here they were more focused on what happened was happening down in la yeah, which but, is why they took monterey so easily and uh, but but i think fremont came through here in the 1500s it that was that was quite a ways back mm. as, as i recall mm. Yeah. Yeah. Four seven nine one zero eight zero two one eight five seven two six. Uh let's see what else. oh are there any more callers, Dave? No, Is no, we okay. we got uh well we got some text messages, I'm sure. Okay. You wanna check those? No, I just want to make sure we got to all the people that waited oh, on. Oh yeah, us, we, we got we got to those guys definitely. Because um, I've been a caller and had to wait. You know, so I know I'm on the on the other did side. I hang of up that. on you too, Mark? Oh, Dave, you know what happened that, <laughs> I remember. that dark day. You told me about it. You told me about it. But that, you know, it's, just, it's just the way you, you've seen now, right? Now that you're here, you see how busy I get. And I would love to tell that. Just... I'd love to tell that story to the listeners. Well, go ahead if you want. So uh, this year on July 3rd, Dave had three Christians on the air, and he was his plan was to confound them and get them to argue. This is on July 3rd. This is part and parcel of the story. Right. So he go. He has on a Protestant, a Methodist. Free Methodist and a Seventh Day Adventist, and he starts with the Protestants. He says, "Okay, now why are you better than them?" And he says, "Well, we're all Protestants." And Dave goes, "Oh," and he goes, "Okay." He goes, "Well, what about you, you Seventh Day Adventist?" He goes, "Oh yeah, well, we just the Sabbath is on Saturday, but we're all grace, we're all Jesus, we're all good." He goes, "Oh, okay. Well, what about you, the uh, Free Methodist?" He goes, "Yeah, we just don't believe in charging for the sermons, but we're all Jesus, we're all grace, and we're all good." And he goes, "Well, I'm confused. Let's take this to the audience." And I'm driving my skid off to the side of the road, and I called Dave. I said, "Dave, I got a question for you." He says, "Mark, go ahead. What is it?" And I said, "Do you have a problem with God's, with man's understanding of God, which is religion?" Or do you deny that there's a divine creator of the universe? And Dave says, thank you for your call and hangs up on me. <laughs> but, you know, so I was the next day yeah. was the 4th of July and I was going to the airport. And while I was driving there, I listened to Dave Michaels broadcasting live from the airport. And I hit the ground running with my wife. She said I ran away. She didn't even know where I was. I come flying up. Dave is seated. And I said, hey, are you Dave Michaels? And he looks at me from a seated position. He says, yeah, who are you? I said, I'm the caller you hung up on last night. And he goes, oh, my God, invoking the name of the Lord. And he puts out his hand to shake my hand. I grab him and yank him out of his chair into a wrestle. And he goes, oh, my God. And I spin him around. I go, no, no, I'm just kidding. It's okay. It's all good. And he goes, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm a local chiropractor, and I wrote a self-help book called The Well of Truth. And Dave says, well, I'm going to have you on the air. And that's how this all happened. That's how it happened. That's how it happened. Uh, Mark Hastings is the author, again, of The Well of Truth. Um, let's see. What else are we going to talk about, Mark? We only have 15 more minutes. Is there anything else that we should cover that we need to cover that well, you wanted to mention? I, I like to hear from our, our audience. If yeah, they have, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if I, they have any tidbits, any questions about Nising Marks, any uh, tips that they want to share, any stories, because, you know, we have a lot of locals here whose families, I mean, generations have been here. Well, again, this all, this all started with me looking for the Betsy Jane, which was Frederick Heen's narrow gauge, famous narrow gauge locomotive, which was fabled to have fallen off the tracks up in Hinkley Creek and fallen down a ravine and was buried. I looked for it. I looked through the historical records, and I found an account of it leaving the Valencia Mill and going up to Felton, which would indicate that that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I never found the remains, but people say that there's people that they've ran into that have found a lost locomotive in Nicey Marks. Well, I, I did the, a complete historical research. I hiked through all those hills, and I never found it. But that led to this really cool show and all this history that we, we went through tonight. So if there's any callers out there that do know where there is a locomotive somewhere in Nicey Marks. I'd like to meet you and talk to you about it. And if and if you do, I'll give you a free book. <laughs> and, you know, there, there is stuff to, to see as you're hiking through Nicey oh, Marks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, all kinds of stuff, really. Yeah, all, all kinds of stuff. I, I, I don't know if it was near Hoffman's <laughs> site during the last big storm, which was not this past winter, but the winter before. And the storm had washed away enough of the mountain that you could see... Um, 
plates and um, um, not China wear necessarily, oh. but but plates and glasses, yeah, yeah. bottles, all this stuff had started to wash from the mountain. They were sticking out. You could just go out there and pick them right well, up. Well, back in the '60s, I, I know guys that would go up there, and there were still all the sheds and things, and there was mm-hmm. still jeans on the shelf and all that kind of wow. thing. Yeah. But so when I was up there looking around, if you go up to Hoffman's historic site, which was the old China camp, that's where 200 Chinese workers lived who dug the roads for the railroad. They were the ones who dug the roads, mm-hmm. the fire roads that we walk on today and call the fire road and nice. Marks and the and the spur lines that go off to Hoffman's and Westridge that went up to Hinkley's Creek and and beyond. But um, if you go right off the side of the trail, either to the left to the right, you're going to find those buildings are still there. They're just laying on the ground. They're still there. There's there's tons of them. They're all over the place up there. If you just walk off the trail and start walking down the side of that canyon, it's just building after building after building after building. It's still all there. Uh huh. Wow, I know. I know. If you go down to Loma Prieta, which is pretty easy to reach, uh, assuming mm-hmm. that you can make a walk, it's not. A re- I don't think there's any hills at all. It's relatively flat land all the way out there. You can still find um, nails and you know oh, tons. little things like that laying around. It's really really cool yeah, to go out there and touch the history. That's the old mill site, and at the peak, they were producing seventy thousand board feet of lumber a day. Seventy thousand board feet. It, t- it takes about fourteen thousand board feet to make a modern size home. So they were really, really cranking out the, the timber there. It was the largest mill in Santa Cruz County. 479-1080-218-5726, DM at KSCO.com. What got you started into um, this part of history? I mean, why? Why? Okay, well, um, I was a mountain biker, and I used to love to ride into Nicene Mark. And then I heard this uh, story about this this train run off the tracks, and it was out there. And we were riding there all the time. You know, I was spending so much time, hours and hours each week, riding through all those trails. And I knew them by heart. And I had seen a lot of this stuff laying around on the ground and didn't really know what it was. But um, I decided, hey, I'm going to try and find that, that steam locomotive and see what, you know, just find it and see what it looks like. So I started searching, and then couldn't find it and eventually ran into John Hibble and he gave me books on the railroads and I did all this research and and I put in so much time trying to find it that I really, really wanted to find it because it was a waste of time. Right, yeah, if you don't. It was like, you know, yeah. So I I just went for it. I I just put my heart to it and that's kind of my my, my personality type. You know, when I go for something, it's like how I wrote this book. I mean, Mm -hmm. when I do it, I do it. Right. You know, I go for it. So let me ask you, do you know where Wright's Tunnel is or Laurel Tunnel? These are the, these are the, the, um, this was up more towards the San Lorenzo Valley, though, not the Aptos Hills. I'm pretty sure that's up by the clock tower in Santa Cruz. If you go down from the clock, clock tower, you know, the, you, you can find the old tracks and there's an old tunnel right there that's blocked off and and that, that tunnel is blocked off there. I think that's it. There is a tunnel that's blocked off somewhere over there, huh? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. 479-1080-218-5726, Four seven nine one zero eight zero two one eight five seven two six DM at KSEO dot com. You know, I've asked this before. I don't know if anybody can answer this. When you go out to the boardwalk, you've been yeah. to the boardwalk, right? And you look in the San Lorenzo River towards the ocean, you're right there at the mouth of the river, and you look off to the left, there in the hillside is this cave. Have you seen that? No. There's a cave there that that's obvious. I mean, it was chiseled into the into the side of the mountain there's a big cave there not big but it's big enough to stand in maybe two uh two people wide and it goes way into the mountain i don't know way into the the cliff i don't know what the purpose of that is but if any if anybody knows what that is i've always wanted to go in there and if anybody has gone in there tell me what you saw because it looks really really cool be careful in those caves why because uh you know like if they were like old mining shafts they have air vents and things that you can fall through. Mm. and uh, That would not be good. No, that would not be good. Yeah, those can be very dangerous places. Yeah. Well, then don't go in there. Um, the, the, you know, they have like black water on the ground because it's so dark, and you can't see what you're stepping in. And sometimes there's like those shafts Holy and things that you cow, can like, break your legs and stuff. Or, or if the, the shaft was full of water and came up to ground level, you wouldn't, yeah. you, for all you know, it would just be a, a puddle and bloop, there yep. you go. Yeah, there you go, yeah. Wow. four seven nine ten eight. Chris calling from Capitola. You are in the air, sir. Hi. Hey, thanks. Uh, okay, I just want to let you know this train thing, it's not a myth and it's not lore. Um, I'm a 1980 Aptos graduate, and we used to ride up uh, to Sandpoint back in the late 70s uh, on Schwinn's, you know, with just single speeds and stuff. Tell, tell me where the location of it is, Chris. 
Okay, well, I'm going to get to that, okay? So we were going up into Nicene Marks before the park was popular, and you'd ride up there. You wouldn't see anybody up there. There was nobody up there. Uh, one night, my friend came back to uh, my house, and some of uh, myself and some friends were hanging out, and he said he found a steam locomotive. They were like, no way, and he swore to God, yes, he found one. He was up there by himself, and he came across a steam locomotive, and it was upright. And the front of the engine was sticking about five feet above the creek. And he checked it out. He said, we got to go check it out. we got to go check it out. It's like, this is awesome. Okay, great, you know. And uh, we, uh, it, it rained and it stormed for about a week, so we couldn't get up there for about a week, and we never were able to find it again. Yeah, I've heard, this, I've heard this story so many times, Chris. I have heard this yeah. story before. Yeah, but, but I'm it, telling you, I, yeah. I did I did all of the research on all of... There's yep. only three locomotives that I've okay. ever been to fi find that were up there. The two Shea yep. ten and a half tons were cut up for scrap at the Aptos station. And the Betsy Jane went up to Felton after it worked in Valencia Creek, which meant okay. that it came out of the hills. So I, I have found old steam donkey boilers out there. But that's not right. a steam engine. That's a steam donkey. No, there were no wheels. A full on train. A full on train. But see, that's like what with, he said. That's not what you saw. There's a difference. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Yeah, so that's the thing. Like, you know, I think, I think people have mistaken old steam donkeys that were left up there as being trains because the boilers look very similar. Those steam donkeys stood 10 feet high. Wow. Yeah. So he, that's, that's more than likely what he found. Thank you for the call, Chris, 479-1080. And that's why the, these things keep uh, persisting, right? That's why these tales, these yeah. legends, these... Legend, uh, yeah. And that's why they keep persisting. That's why I did all this research. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, researching the stuff is fun, right? I mean, yeah, if, if yeah, you're yeah. into it, I, you know, I've been researching Holy City... Um, for the past few weeks, oh, really I, focusing I, I on, on the radio station up there, right? Because he had a radio station up there, and I've been finding out a lot more about was, um, who's, the radio was, station. Was that, that Billy was, Graham? That, that was uh, Father Riker, and he started Father out. Father Riker, that's right. He started out in Berkeley uh, with a church over there, and then he um, let me see, he went from Berkeley to uh, San Francisco. And uh, worked with the church up there, sharing the airwaves, and then uh, decided to come down here to Holy City, where he got his own um, radio frequency, which was, I believe, 1240 AM was KFQU from Holy City. Cool, cool. Yeah, and uh, that, that's a real interesting um, project that I'm working on now is is the radio history of Holy City. That's that's fun. That is cool. really, really fun. Uh, 479-1080, let's head out to Aptos. Wanna yeah. Head out to Aptos? Yeah. Joe, thank you for your call. You're in the air. Yeah, you better check your history on Fremont there. Maybe Google them up on the dates. Yeah, I got you the dates wrong. Yeah. I got them right. A couple hundred years. I think it was, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, and, Joe. Uh, and my, so he saw two engines up there. He lived his whole life up there. He passed away, but I never got to go up there with him to see it. Got donkeys, because I found those when I was a kid. Yeah. We found them old sawmills, all kinds of used to roam. I grew up in the summer. Road. We, we were roaming around these hills in 1961 and stuff, just on foot, going everywhere. And then motorcycles later up. Before 19 March was even, I don't even know if it was a park then. We just called it uh, the Cascade and we'd just drive all through there. Well, but that's the cool, station Joe. Tunnel is still visible. Bottom yeah. right station road off the summit, the old tunnel was still there. Right, I've been right. up there for 20 years, but. And so is the local tunnels are there, their water storage. There, there we are there are land. locomotives up there, Joe. There are old locomotives. Where, there. where? Because he's breaking up. I can barely up, up near uh, Wright Station. Because I, I ran into. Um, well, for a while, I was a chiropractor for a local uh, work comp hospital, and we I had the railroad workers from Roaring Camp as patients. Mm. And they knew about a lot of uh, steam engines. And I asked them the question about Nicene, and they're like, "No." Nah, uh -uh. But then they told me where other ones were, and I never went and looked for them. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do, you, what do you mean where other ones are? They're like broken down on the side of railroads out there in the hills somewhere? They're somewhere in Santa Cruz. Apparently there's three steam locomotives that are that were scrapped or whatever, and they're, they're around. Um, if you go up and talk with the guys at Roaring Camp, there's an interesting group of boys up there. Damn, dude, they're that is so cool. They're different kind of people. I, I, if you want to hear this show again, go to zbsradio.com because you're going to want to hear this show again. As a matter of fact, Mark, I will stay up late, uh, not tonight because I'm going to be busy, uh, tomorrow and, and get this thing podcasted on our YouTube channel so they can check it out there as well. Sweet. This is great. Dude. This is fantastic. Uh, we got enough time to take at least one more call. Dave, I'll stay on for a few more minutes. I don't, okay. I don't right. have to leave right away. All right, let's see uh, what Robert has to say. Calling from Santa Cruz. You're in the air, Robert. 
Yeah, you know those uh, that that cave you were talking about on the side of the cliff up there mm-hmm. by the ocean? Yeah. Those those are uh, lookout nests for the uh, military, and there's a bunch of them all up and down the coast. We used to go to them when we were kids. They try to block them off by, by blowing some of them up, and and you used to be able to get to uh, to them through there's little entrances out by uh, um, some of these parking lots um, and some of these beaches that you go to, like up by San Gregorio and stuff. And they would be hidden off to the side, and you could climb down in it and go out to the end there. And there was like this little room cut off to the side, and and you would just be able to stand there and just look out on the ocean and watch for Japanese and that kind of stuff. And that's what I was told that was what those were for. And there's a bunch of them, except for, uh, you know, like I said, when we were kids, we used to get in them, and people got hurt, so they closed them down. But, yeah, you can still see them from if you're out in the water and stuff. You'll see these holes in the wall as you're driving along. And um, Interesting. Um, yeah, you know, thank you for the call, Robert, 479-1080. Um, I have heard, you know, people really were concerned about the Japanese at one point. Yeah. Here and, and even in Holy City, uh, Father Riker was so concerned about the Japanese um, attacking Holy City. I don't know why they would want to do that, but he was worried that they would attack Holy City. So he had them build, you know, lookout towers to watch for Japanese. Yeah, a tower would seem more plausible than a tunnel. Uh, well, if you're looking for a plane, but if you're looking for a submarine... You might uh, a, a tunnel out on the ocean might come in handy. No, why, well, no. I guess a tower would, would be better. Why would standing in a tunnel aid your vision? Yeah. I when I look at the ocean, I just look at it. Mm-hmm. I don't usually dig a tunnel to look at the ocean. Yeah. Do you? No, I haven't done that. Four seven nine one zero eight zero two one eight five seven two six. Someone dug out that tunnel for some reason. I know, I know. I just don't see the value of it aiding you in looking for Japanese. The tunnel. But maybe. I Who mean, knows? Uh, yeah, Who knows? I mean, there, maybe the optics of in the darkness, or I don't, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, we are speaking with Mark Hastings again. Tell us the name of your book, Mark. The name of the book is The Well of Truth, The Secret to Living a Better Life. It has the information that will give you control of your life. It'll give you control of your thinking, all the thoughts that you think. It's a simple book. It takes an hour to read, and it takes a minute a day, a simple exercise. I've used it in my life. All of my patients have used it. I've got... Many, many, many testimonials of people telling me that they read the book and their life immediately changed. And the thing is that when you get control of your thinking, when you do get control of your thinking, your circumstances change so rapidly that you won't believe it. That's what people tell me. Uh, other books that you have read for, for history, because, you know, I mean, you didn't just learn this stuff by asking people, or did you? Well, I know. I, d- I definitely learned it through books. Mm-hmm. I, I read many books. My favorite book was a book at the turn of the century by an author named James Allen. He wrote a book called As a Man Thinketh. And the fundamental principle in that book is good thoughts produce good, desirable circumstances. Bad thoughts produce undesirable circumstances. But every thought that you have does produce circumstances in your life. And those thoughts produce the circumstances which create your destiny, and that's what happens in your life. But that book is old. That book is old, and it's as right as rain, and it's as true as can be. But one of the reasons why I wrote this book is it was written in archaic English, and a lot of people today don't know how to interpret that mm. kind of language. I was, mm-hmm. I'm older, and I know how. So mm. anyway, I wrote a book. It's 60 pages. It takes an hour to read. It's a simple read. It normally retails for 20 bucks. Pick it up at the bookshop Santa Cruz or online at Amazon. Kindle, ebook, iPad. It's available everywhere where books are sold. Sports Med Chiropractor, who are, uh, who are some of the people that go see you? Hikers? Bikers? Everybody. Um, sports Med means that we treat more than the neck and the back. We treat shoulders, wrists, ankles, hands, feet, all you know, knees, everything. That's what that means. And so I've had a family practice for 23 years here in Aptos and have treated thousands and thousands of you folks. And a lot of you listening know me. Hey, Mark, before we take off and uh, to the top of the hour, how did you travel these trails up in Nizing Marks? Primarily. By unicycle, Dave. <laughs> By unicycle. One wheel. <laughs> that is so cool, man. Well, so, it was definitely different. <laughs> 479 You are listening to AM 1080, KSEO Santa Cruz Flight 1080. If you want to listen to this show uh, rebroadcasted or a podcast, check out zbsradio.com.